Amazing. Um, welcome, everybody. My name's Karen, and I've got the wrong slides up. I don't know why. Um, anyway, uh, so this was our event last night. Uh, so last night we also had a blockchain event which uh, raised money for the Crypto Fire Alliance. So um, I am part of the board for Blockchain Australia, so I was just going to give you an update on where we're all at. Uh, we have a new board. Um, oh, this is really having fun. This thing. Okay. That's all right. It's, it's on its way. It's fine. So uh, what's happening at BA? We have a new board um, and myself, Nick, DJ, any other board members? Grant. Grant. Where are you, Grant? The back. Yeah. On the board. So um, thanks to everyone who voted and thanks for the support. And one thing we did notice is there are only two females out of the 12 directors. So uh, we're quickly working to address that with what we call an observership program, which allows women to come onto the board and have a look at all the great stuff that we're doing um, and to be confident to apply the following year. We're also looking at something very controversial, which is quotas for women's for boards. So if anyone's got a really strong opinion, come and see me or, or Nick or DJ. We, um, we're definitely debating that at the moment. Um, and um, pros and cons and everything like that. Uh, what else we've got? The Blockies Awards coming up in Melbourne on the 29th of uh, April. They are open now for entry. Please feel free to apply. There's individual and business awards. So uh, we're super excited. This is our second one. Um, have we got our host yet? Not yet? No host yet? Okay. It's soon, we have a host. Uh, we have a women's event in Melbourne um, on the 28th, which is opening the APAC blockchain event. Um, and uh, if you would like to sign up as a member to support events such as this, the individual price is $89. We're going to get some fantastic offers from our members, such as BTC Markets and Mind Digital. And so when you sign up, you'll probably get more in crypto than you will be paying for your membership, which will be really exciting. Um, and other than that, uh, I will hand over to Nick, who's going to talk a bit about the blockchain roadmap, which has been our biggest piece of news. Oh, there is a job everybody, there is a job um, a around the blockchain roadmap. So if you want to apply for that job, it's with the federal government um, and it is implementing the blockchain roadmap and helping us to, to get that going. So if anyone's interested in hearing more about that, come and see me, I'll send you a link. Hand over to Nick. Thanks, Karen, and hello, everybody. Um, the National Blockchain Roadmap, put your hand up if you've heard of it. All right, that's good. Put, keep your hand up if you've read it. Okay, not too bad. The whole thing or just the summary? How many times did you have to wake up to read? Yeah. Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, is it is it like the best thing you've ever seen or is it just blah, right? So hands up for blah. Okay, there's a couple of blahs up the back there. <laughs> Thanks, Omar. Uh, is, it, is it a really good step, uh, you know, for Australia? few more okay so here, here's my thoughts on, on where we're at with this thing um, uh, if you compare the output of our national blockchain roadmap with similar documents from countries around the world I'd give it a 6 out of 10 ob objectively uh, Germany issued their national blockchain strategy in September last year and the English language summary is about four times as big as our roadmap right now, I'm married to a German, so I can tell you I know why that's the case, right? I understand the psychology of how that comes about. Um, you know, but, but quite seriously, a lot of other countries are still significantly further ahead than Australia in thinking through how blockchain is going to impact their economies and societies and have taken steps that we frankly need to copy. But that 6 out of 10, in my point of view, is still a damn sight better than the 0 out of 10, which is where we were 12 months ago. So I'm choosing to take a, a glass half full rather than a glass half empty view around the National Blockchain Roadmap. And some of you might, might have been here when I spoke about it last, but you'll remember that I predicted that there would be uh, three main use cases that would get attention, agricultural supply chain, um, educational credentials, and a portable KYC. All of those are featured in there. Um, and really the next step now is to hold the government, I guess, to some of the some of the promises in here to turn this from a piece of paper into a structure and a process and uh, I'm pleased to say that 
the advisory committee that helped uh, uh, helped sort of set the direction for the roadmap uh, is being retained and in fact expanded. Um, if you're a bureaucrat, this will be really important to you. The advisory committee is becoming a steering committee. Um, the significance of that completely escaped me, but it was explained to me that that means it comes with formal governance structures from the, the public service and it actually has a, an official role, if you like, whereas an advisory committee is an entirely arm's length and, you know, they can walk away from it sort of thing. So that's a, that's a nice step. Uh, I've been in discussions with the Department of Industry these last two weeks about how we can not only build out the steering committee, but actually create some working groups to specifically look at some of the opportunities in detail that have been outlined in, in, the, in the roadmap. No steering committee is possibly going to be able to cover both the breadth and the depth of detail that a serious attempt uh, to move forward on this agenda uh, will require. So we're looking to create a steering committee, obviously overall governance, but then some detailed working groups, uh, particularly around those three areas, uh, agricultural supply chain, educational qualifications, KYC, probably one around regulation and probably one around markets. Now this is my input as and Blockchain Australia's input. Obviously the government is still to respond to that, uh, but I'm hopeful that they will, will follow that path. Um, the other critique that was made about the roadmap is that at the moment uh, there's no money and that's true um, and in fact there won't be any money um, in the formal budgetary process. The government's made it entirely clear that between bushfires, coronavirus, paying for change rooms and meeting a surplus, uh, there will be no opportunity for um, uh, additional funding. However, there are programs that have current budget allocations available and I won't say too much right now, but we're working on ways to make claims on, on money that is there, pools of money that are available for allocation. Um, so if anyone can introduce me to Bridget McKenzie, that would be helpful. But in the absence of that, um, we're going to have to try to persuade them on, on logic. So that's basically a, a short summary of where we're at with the blockchain roadmap. I'm more optimistic about the potential for the government to really get serious than I have been uh, for some time. Uh, six months from now, we'll know because this will either be a dead piece of paper that will be forgotten or it will be the foundations for some serious action that will hopefully provide better ways to mobilise some of the amazing talent that we have in this country to deliver on the potential that we all know is there, but we've got to get that little bit of corporate and government support to make it happen. So thanks very much. If you've got any questions, come find me at some point. Yep, cheers. Thanks, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Okay, great. So I want to welcome to the stage now um, Maria Atkinson from Power Ledger. She's a advisor to Power Ledger. Maria is passionate about sustainability, works with very senior people in government, Nick, <coughs> and business generally. She's expert in the realms of sustainability, uh, highly sought after thought leader, and um, has been part of many important conversations about building sustainable future companies and nations. Now. For her recognition for this numerous contributions, Maria has actually been awarded a member of the General Division of the Order of Australia. And this is our first AM in the room. So a big round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, David. Thanks, guys. Wasn't expecting that. Okay, so uh, thank you, Nick, with the roadmap. It's a lot of work and uh, I think Power Ledger's down in Canberra next week trying to fight on tax. So Power Ledger did the first uh, initial coin offering raised 34 million three years ago and uh, set itself up successfully for trials around the world. So David's asked me to do a little bit about Power Ledger. If you don't know it, I'm going to explain it. Um, and then I'm going to give you an update on projects because first of all, I want to see a show of hands. Who has Power Tokens? Yay, thank you. Thank you, although it's down, it's going to go up. Okay, so um, the founders, there's three of them. They're all based in Perth and it's a great place to be based internationally. Um, these guys are offshore a lot and they have an extraordinary amount of visitation. So their goal, their objective is the democratisation of power. And I think it's really important. We've just gone through um, you know, a series of discussions 
in families, friends, households, communities around action on climate change over the Christmas break. And so we have to add to the priorities our energy system has to transform. We just can't keep using dirty, unclean power sources and generate in remote parts of Australia and transmit it to where the population lives, when 90% of Australians live in places like Sydney, urban areas. So I predict the blockchain in the energy transformation is going to be the next decade of activity. So these guys came up three years ago with the whole idea and I'm going to talk you through some of their business models. So one's called a U-Grid. So I want to imagine you live in an apartment building, okay? I want to imagine somebody in the apartment building is a FIFO, flies in, flies out, so they're not home that much. Half the apartment building sitting at home, working from home or just not working at home, and the other half is at work. And you've got solar panels and a battery in this apartment building. So the blockchain platform PowerLedger enables prosumers, people that are generating more energy than they're using, to sell their excess energy to somebody who needs it when they're not there. So the prosumer-consumer model is essentially this apartment building working behind the grid today, selling power to each other. Now you can set a price in an apartment building, these projects exist across Australia, where you could pay a certain amount for your power and the profits could go to run all your communal services. So your lifts, your pool, those kind of things can be run off a, um, a centralised, monetised way of internalising your price of power. So this U-Grid is can be across a house, but importantly, it's being applied in apartment buildings. So the guys kind of started with this. They said, this is pretty simple. We can do it. Let's apply it on some projects. And they have done it, particularly in Australia and particularly in Western Australia. Then the next one is, in the property industry, the X-Grid, where I want to go outside of the property, outside the building, and I want to maybe go across the road. So the X-Grid model is that you're trading energy across buildings and across the road. There's certain legislation that enables that and there's certain legislation that prevents that in various parts of the world. But there's a project I'll talk later about where this is being realised. So essentially, the blockchain is giving you this real-time settlement of who's generating at five-minute intervals, who's generating energy, what they're using, the excess, what price they're selling it, and smart contracts are determining who to sell it to, at what price, and doing the whole settlement based on a power ledger platform. So you can now go across buildings, not just within the apartment building. And then they said, well, why don't we think about cities, a virtual power plant? So I want you to imagine an energy system where we're not just generating remotely, we're actually in the city and with photovoltaic technology emerging and changing all the time, we might be able to wrap buildings in PVs very soon. But at the moment, photovoltaics are traditionally stuck on the roof and battery systems are within buildings or within city um, precincts, the city block. So a power ledger virtual power plant, which has now been launched in South Australia, is where you connect every building and with smart contracts are determining who to sell the power to at what price and keeping all of this automated. It also enables you to manage the grid needs. Hot day, demand goes up, certain things are down, certain things are happening. The grid has various needs. And the virtual power plant model is that with your smart contract, you can determine at what price to sell to the grid. And the grid can call on all these sources, even electric vehicles that have got excess in their battery that they don't need, can all start selling to the grid or to each other. So you imagine a suburb, you imagine a whole city like Fremantle starting to work as virtual power plants. So that's my kind of next generation of idea of energy transformation where PowerLedge is playing at the moment. So the projects around the world, Thailand is the example of going across the street or across the city. So in Bangkok, it's the biggest commercial pilot project using blockchain in the world. And it's a dental hospital, a couple of commercial buildings, a small school with a large roof and residential apartment blocks. And some have got solar power on them and some don't. 
but you have to imagine the school at 3.30 in the afternoon till about 7.30 it's generating power and no one's there. Every weekend it's generating power and no one's there. So it's selling the power at a price across the city to the dental hospital whose roof is shaded and it can't put solar panels on it. So this commercial pilot project got the attention in Thailand and now they're rolling it out in villages and looking at city programs at the moment from this trial. So have a look at that one. There's lots of this online with Power Ledger. So in the USA, they partnered with a renewable energy developer. And this was kind of a way to say, when you charge electric vehicles, you need some kind of settlement. And these guys were waiting 90, 120 days in order to get the bills paid from generating renewable energy, so photovoltaics on the rooftop, electric vehicles coming in, charging up, and then the bill not really being paid until three months plus down the track. So Power Leisure developed its platform so it can um, measure how much energy is generated, who's using it, and automatically pass the bill. So the uh, owner, the Clearway, who's got projects all across the US, was pretty excited about this. And then they started to say, well, we also can claim in California renewable energy credits these certificates that say the energy was green, it was from a renewable, uh, non-polluting source. And the settlement of this normally goes through various brokers, it's always got lawyers involved and it takes a long time, and your amount of money you get on selling this renewable energy credit has shrunk. So Power Ledger Guy said, well, we can do that, we can help you with a platform. So just recently, in the last month, they launched a renewable energy credit um, platform and in the US that renewable energy credit platform with their partner is worth about three billion US a year so it's no small project to be m managing who's generating the renewable energy credit who's buying it and following it all the way through to settlement this is a global business but in the US three billion a year so that was a, a pretty new thing and it started from just monetizing how to uh, manage charging electric vehicles in the US. So in Japan, they've been working with um, the second biggest uh, energy retailer, um, utility as we call them, Kepco, um, and they did a trial. Kepco likes them, they're doing another trial. So Japan has three projects at the moment. Malaysia saw what Thailand was doing and said we need to increase the amount of renewable energy uh, penetration across our cities. So we want to encourage uh, more solar panels and we want to also look at this distributed energy where we could sell and have peer-to-peer -peer energy trading across Malaysia. So there's a project that PowerLedger is the only blockchain provider working with the government agency to test uh, a large-scale solar in, um, in Malaysia. In India, same kind of thing. Um, ISGF has been selected, it's a government not-for-profit um, quasi group and in the biggest state in India, um, Uttar Pradesh, we're doing a trial there. Um, in addition to that, we completed the first style trial in Delhi's largest electricity distributed company and that um, has proven that the peer-to-peer -peer energy trading model and the distributed energy model is something that India is interested in. So that's kind of good for Asia Pacific. Um, for Europe, in France, uh, every city and country has kind of a different take on what they want from energy. But in France, people want to know where their energy has been generated and they want to make choices. So they might wake up one day and choose on their app and say, I want hydropower, 100% hydropower. Or I'm from Lyon and I want my solar power from Lyon to come to me today. So the platform that we've developed in France is to enable identification of where the energy is, track it, monetize it, same kind of blockchain application. But the consumer or customer interface is pretty cool and different. There's a project in Austria where they're doing a virtual power plant and they're starting in a small part of a city in Austria and PowerLedge is one of the key blockchain providers there. And just recently we an, uh, announced a partnership with a utility in Italy and it's Italy's largest utility and I think they've got something like 280,000 customers. Um, and Power Ledger was one of seven, I think it was, chosen to do a trial there in Italy uh, just a couple of weeks ago. So back to home, we've got live peer-to-peer -peer trading in Fremantle. There's a lot of these projects in Western Australia. 
Um, there's a, quite a lot happening in South Australia, the cheapest place to get energy, and it's solar. Um, the battery solar model is the South Australian government gives uh, a concession on battery, about 60% of the cost of battery the government will subsidise in South Australia, about 40% of Victoria, nothing yet in New South Wales, but I think they're going to announce that. And we've got projects with large... Um, Large customers in Queensland, Victoria, pretty cool one to be announced soon in Victoria and New South Wales. So it's happening, it's just slower at home, interestingly, than it is offshore. Um, we were having that conversation earlier and that's Power Ledger. So go buy more power tokens and thank you. Any questions? Hi, Maria. Can everyone hear me through that microphone? Hello. I know, I know, don't worry, it's all right. I'm on top of that. I'm all over. Sorry. Fred. Hello. Hello. Oh, cool. Hey, Maria. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much for telling us about the awesome stuff that you're doing um, with Power Ledger. I was just wondering, is Power Ledger um, going to change its tokenomics model? And what's sort of happening there? Because, um, yeah, just trying to understand, it, a lot of it's been about staking for buildings and things like that. So just trying to understand how does that align to the tokenomics model? I don't think there's plans at the moment. It's still to stick with an asset. People have invested knowing that the power tokens link to assets rather than something else. Um, I know that they just did a, an update through Telegram and they've got some stuff on the website where they're constantly interacting about what might be. But the four major projects and the focus on that is very much the that's all they're going to do for the next year. So no change as far as I'm aware to the token model and still offering on the market and listed in Australia now as well, um, on the market saying it's an asset um, linked crypto. So that's a bit unique. Question there. I'll come back for your question, no, Karen. Question oh, Steve is asking a question then. Thanks, mate. It's a bit disconcerting Thanks, David. to see someone speaking all day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that, Maria. That was a great uh, presentation. Last year, Anya was here and was talking about you guys potentially looking at doing a, a platform of where people could potentially fund solar projects. Is that something that's still in the pipeline? So there was a bit of an ACCC kind of um, slap for the asset germination yep. project. Um, so they have made one investment um, and they've got a, I think it's a PPA, which is... I forget what that acronym means, but it's something... Power like Purchasing Agreement. There we are. Um, but so that I think they've signed the 20-year one of that. So there's no um, real asset germination focus at the moment simply because it just got smacked with how it was sold and how it was offered. It's not off the priority list. It's still there. And if there's opportunities to raise capital and invest to get it charging. But I do think that the market shifted in the last 18 months and we're running to catch up with other investors that have got the infrastructure, the batteries, the solar. So the South Australian project for the virtual power plant is even with Sonnen, the world's largest battery provider. So Power Ledger doesn't need to go and buy the batteries, just partner with Sonnen. So I think the asset germination, I don't think people want to let it go because it's got potential, but it's just a minor piece at the moment. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Grant. Karen? I'm loving this box, it's so cool. Um, hey, thanks for the update. So over the summer I watched 2040 and um, watched the Red Grid guys, um, looked a bit dodgy, but um, like it sort of showed the power of being able to just not be governed by grids and all that sort of stuff. What's your thought on how that sort of stuff's going globally? Um, the World Economic Forum last year, about 80% of conversation was on energy and about 80% of that conversation was governments that control or own energy not wanting to free up the market. So it's pretty fucked in terms of um, vested interests in an old infrastructure model. But emerging markets uh, are the ones where the excitement is. Um, and I also think that people who make investments in renewable and batteries want a better return on investment. And if there's a way to get a price point that's better than the ship price you get currently selling to the grid, um, and also wanting to keep a grid, if you've got one, 
and want to balance the grid so you don't get blackouts, etc., having a smart contract and a blockchain platform that does that automatically is just a no-brainer. So I feel like the common sense will just switch it. Um, but there's a lot of regulation and vested yeah. interest globally on energy markets, yeah. Question? Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. We're filming, remember? <laughs> All right. Is the oh, blockchain you system you rec um, seeing here either the energy resources are decentralized? Is for recording only, transactional recording only? So, um, yeah, essentially. For so electricity, energy resources by per meters, how you do? pricing by using blockchain. I'm just curious for the blockchain operating system um, using here. And as well as a trading, I had a look your trading. Um, does it mean Power Ledger also itself has um, a trading exchange platform? Okay. Uh, running as an OTC market type of thing, trading um, energy resources, um, like um, a commodities on the OTC market, okay. and what is the pricing? What is the spread? Wow. Okay. <laughs> so we got an hour. So I'm not a trader or um, an expert in the area that you're asking, but there's yes. a couple of key things to make a point of. Um, you need to have a smart meter, and you need to have a cloud-based communication, and then you do the coding on the smart contract to determine price points. So, um, mm -hmm. in my apartment block. You can set those price points and have a trading model that's agreed by a strata group of people. Very different to the price model of what the grid will pay in certain locations at certain times of the day. So the grid will pay for you know, various stability demand requirements, certain prices. At a peak loading, a grid will put out a call option and the smart contract could say, I need X amount in my community battery to hold to manage this, but I've got, say, 30% of my battery. At that price, I'm going to sell 80% of my battery because we're going to make a lot of money on the grid. So it's written into contracts about price point, and it varies. I know right. you're looking confused, but it's not yes, one answer. Indeed. It's not one answer mm. per contract. And the electricity market, there's all sorts of rules, and we tend to partner with the retailers who've mm -hmm. got obligations to buy enough energy and meet their customer demand. So we're working with the retailers on the price point, but it is changing. In South Australia, um, a retailer is saying you can use the grid now as much as you like, and it'll just be three dollars a day flat rate. And so the transaction across the, the grid, the amount of transaction opportunities, makes it a very, very affordable option for individual householders to be selling across the grid at that $3 price point. So it is changing, but certain states and certain retailers and certain network operators have certain prices at certain times of day. So I can't answer your question right. in detail. Okay, thank you. Um, what about the payment method? Is that limited to cryptocurrency only, or could it be any format of the payment options? It's in, it's in local currency. So um, the way the um, Power Ledger works is there's a power token. It's kind of like a license agreement to use the platform, the Power Ledger platform. And those uh, power tokens are escrowed. And then there's a Sparks token that measures the kilowatt hour of energy generated and used. And that's settled in the lowest point. Um, so it would be one cent in Australia, one cent in the US, um, one is it, what is it in euro in cents? Is it cents? Thanks. One cents in euro. So it, it um, the Sparks tokens normalize and apply the local currency, and that's what you settle it in, in the currency, not the power token. Okay, so the customer category also includes individual household. <coughs> it's only two uh, questions allowed uh, per right. person. <laughs> so the biggest <laughs> competitors would be like Energy Australia, yeah. these... All right. And they're also partners because they realise that um, if you're an energy retailer, yes. so not a network operator, you're not managing massive generation, you're just um, a label that sells energy to customers. Correct. Okay? If you're an, uh, an energy retailer, then about 80% of your cost is trying to get customers stick. You want to have those customers and keep those customers. There's a lot of admin cost and operational cost that goes in keeping those customers. 
So if customers are getting smarter by saying, I can get more money for my power, then they'll go with retailers that will give them the more money. So Power Ledger is maybe got about eight or ten really friendly retailers like Power Club who are working with us to enable um, a better relationship. So the retailers are our friend. The network operators are a problem because they have to allow the cross-grid uh, training. All right, understood. So Power Ledger is like electronic um, energy resources distributor. Yeah, it's all on distributed energy resources, DERs. That's the business model. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm interested. Wow. I may I raise questions. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's, that's great. Awesome. Question. Okay, look, on, the, more. on that note, I want to thank Maria. A big round of applause for Maria. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Awesome. That was great. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, good. Rolling straight along. I'll welcome Tim Lee to the stage, who has recently been to Myanmar and been doing a little bit of work up there and thought he'd best tell you guys what's happening in blockchain in the developing nations in the Southeast Asia. Thank you, Tim. Oh, do you want that one as well? Thank you. Right, how are we doing? Um, yeah, uh, as David said, we've just come back, the three of us, the three founders have just come back from Myanmar, we're formerly known as Burma, um, where we spent 10 days training about 120 staff of the largest bank out there and looking at product discovery. Um, and there are some surprising issues that have come out of that practical experience of dealing with a frontier market and looking at blockchain. I mean, how many people have actually been to uh, Myanmar? Oh, good, we've got some people who've been there. Fantastic, okay. Hmm? It's, it's, it's really, it's a very, I, I would actually recommend people go. It's, 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 very, it's very different and very interesting. I'll give you some facts about Myanmar, just to sort of paint some of the, the, the background relating to some of the challenges and some of the opportunities that are there. I mean, basically, independent from the British, I mean, I, I, I stand here as a British person and say, good job that uh, the British relinquished all their, all their um, uh, activities. Um, the democratic government was elected in 2015, but 25% of the government seats are held by the military. That's in the constitution. Okay, um, there are ongoing, there are still 13 conflict zones in Myanmar where there's still ongoing civil wars between rival factions. So those are places that you don't want to go if you go to, if you go to Myanmar. Um, it's transforming from, you know, transitioning from military rule to full open democracy. But there's, in that transition period, that presents some challenges, as you can probably imagine. Um, and Burma has had some... Uh, you know, some, some issues that are well documented. Um, but, you know, s and some generals individually are sanctioned by the UN. Okay? Uh, it's a really good place, honestly. Um, and there are, but there's a population of 54 million, and it's predominantly a Buddhist country. Okay? So it's, it's got some really interesting, interesting things. And one thing that is really bizarre when you go there, they drive on the right with right-hand drive cars. And just to give you an indication of the, the sort of the culture, apparently a general about 1972 or 73 or something decided overnight that they, instead of driving on the left with right-hand drive cars, they were going to drive on the right. And that happened overnight. All right, so it gives you a sense of, yeah, this is um, an interesting place. All right? So... I mean, just from an economic point of view, it's about 69 billion in GDP. Yeah, GDP per capita is about 1,700 bucks US. And if you compare that to Australia, 55,000, it's a pretty poor country, as you get an idea. They did start welcoming international investment in 2011. And they've got a GDP growth of about 6.6%, inflation about 7%. Um, but 65% of the Myanmar population has no access to grid electricity. Okay. So when you think of connecting to computers and that type of thing, it presents some challenges. And 70% 70, 70 of the Myanmar population live in rural areas, but there's 90% of mobile coverage. Okay, and just a, a one bit of fact, this is the, uh, actually the, Swen the uh, <laughs> Shwedagon Pagoda that contains up to 60 tonnes of gold and was first created in the 6th century. So it's all this juxtaposed position that's weird, but it's actually a really interesting place. 
Now, from a banking point of view, how many are there any ex bankers in the room besides me? Okay, one. Okay, only one that's confessing. Oh, we've got two. That's okay. All right. Now, in Myanmar, it's a 95% cash economy. Now, we actually went around a number of the, the actual bank branches. This bank's got 500 branches. And this is what you regularly see. Literally, in an open office at the back of a bank, you have piles of cash. All right? Now, because people are, you know, it is only 1700 bucks per person as a GDP, most people ha deal with the smaller notes. So the notes, the notes are about, uh, they're about, uh, yeah, about, a hundred, about a thousand chat is about one Aussie dollar, just to put it in perspective. Now, in 2003, there were massive bank runs. So there's a lack of trust by a lot of older folks in Myanmar, all right? And often, the safest store of cash is still seen to be under the mattress, all right? Weird as it may seem, except during the monsoon season, when it absolutely buckets it down with rain for four months solid, all the notes start turning moldy. So what do they do? They bring them into the banks, and then the banks have to send them to the central bank, and that leads to a bucket load of health problems all around the central bank in Myanmar. Now, I'm, again, I'm just giving you a sense of what, yeah, where, where this, this country is. The taxis have no meters. You negotiate a price and you pay in cash. They say, yes, it's going to be you know, the equivalent of four, $4, and it takes you about probably to Bondi and back almost. It's, it's insane. But there's, complete, there's trust that's there, but it's, it's just a cultural sense of trust. It's really, it's really kind of weird. Um, and this is the key thing. The average $1,000 chat note has 70 75 days of urine-related bacteria on it. Okay, now that's a fact from the bank, all right? And this really is a major, major problem because it really does cause sicknesses in the central bank, all right? Because the, you know, in terms of banking, the central banks have a clearing system and it is cash, all right? They physically move cash to the new capital, which was, uh, is 360 uh, Ks from Yangon, formerly known as Rangoon, which is the main, main business capital. And it has to be planned like a military operation. We had extensive discussions with the guys that handle their cash management. And, you know, it's 14 days to plan a movement and involves 24 staff to move cash. And this is stuff that has 75 days of urine-based bacteria. Okay. The legal infrastructure is really weak. It's a paper-based system that's fading documents, and there's no centralized digital land title registration, for example. So as a banker, trying to get hold of security is a nightmare. And fraud historically has been, been rampant, but the key thing is in 2021, international banks are being allowed in. So that gives you a sense of what's actually going on in this country, and you think, why the hell do they need blockchain? You know, is it, anyway, everything's based around cash and that type of thing. And we, we've, when we first went over there, we started hearing these things and we're thinking, what the hell are we doing here? But when you've got lemon, you make lemonades, all right? Now, of course, the, the big issue is that the big crypto dream, let's be honest, has been we're going to bank 1.7 billion people globally, all right? We're going to bank those people. That's been the big crypto dream. You know, banking the unbanked and taking out the banking system, leveraging the crypto rails. Well, I'm sorry to say that is a load of baloney in Myanmar because through existing technology, the bank we're operating with, through smart segmentation, um, with using existing mobile technology and their branch network, they're actually leapfrogging everything. And they have actually, they launched an app in 2018, late 2018. They've got four and a half million subscribers and three and a half million of them have been KYC'd at a dollar a pop. Okay. And they have what is termed as banking with kindness. At the actual C-suite level, it's, you know, the, the bank is run by one of the major families in, uh, in Myanmar and very much they are following the Buddhist philosophy. So they are deliberately banking, you know, trying to bank the unbanked. And so you think, where does blockchain fit into all this? And it's very much, so much of it is about the core essence of the blockchain. 
and very much sort of regaining and establishing trust because so many people um, have, you know, they lost money with bank runs and there were severe problems. There was a, a great lack of, lack of trust. It's about providing transparency, which is what the blockchain does. And it's digitizing internal systems with immuta immutability. So you can actually take whatever records they've actually got and create an, you know, a product that is actually workable and is, uh, and is measurable. Um, it's also addressing historic corruption because there's been a lot of corruption. There's been a lot of, a lot of cases where the military historically have forcibly taken people's homes. Now, because there's no land title registry system, it's a uh, you know it's a real it's a real challenge, and certainly, you know, by providing those wider supportive infrastructure issues, that can actually really help an awful lot of the disadvantage there. But the problem is. We were talking to some lawyers linked into land title and trying to establish a blockchain, blockchain structure to develop land title. And they've had death threats. Okay. But the key thing is there, there are actually lots of opportunities by getting knee deep into the fundamentals of the blockchain. And it's that invisible layer of empowerment. And there, you know, we're... Um, we've we did a lot of product discovery, and we've we've actually got six products that are on the table with them at the moment for discussion. And the first, if it happens, will launch uh, in May. We're just waiting for the final sign-off. The biggest problem is that Myanmar has a massive border with China, so at the moment, the coronavirus is creating obviously havoc for them in terms of the inflows and outflows of people. And so the key takeaways I would say: developing countries are actually incredibly motivated, right? They actually recognize there's a hell of a lot of opportunity for them there. How many of you have been to sort of corporate, corporate training sessions in either your current life or a previous life? All right, lots of us. And how enjoyable were they on a scale of one to 10? Right, probably zero, right? And it used to be the situation, I mean, I can, I can hear myself sort of, think, yeah, sort of saying, right, okay, entertain me. I've got 30 emails I've got to answer, entertain me with this training. These guys were incredibly motivated. And some of the product ideas we had coming out from them, once they understood the technology, were phenomenal. And it's about leapfrogging. And that's a major driver for these developing countries. Leapfrogging a whole raft of systems that actually exist currently. Unfortunately, I think crypto's role is likely to be very, very limited. Um, as the banks empower themselves through the core of blockchain tech. And it's very much about the banks are talking to each other about how can they work together linking into blockchain-based tech. So it's all helping with the, you know, the infrastructure of trust. So my key takeaway is developing countries should not, be, should not be ignored. They've got so much more to gain. And if you've got any sort of ideas that you think might be uh, you know, worth exploring developing countries, just come over and have a chat. We're really interested in exploring where this can go. So that's my take in 10 minutes on you know, blockchain and frontier markets, our practical experience from Myanmar. Thank you. Are you sticking around? Tim, will be, Tim will be sticking around. So thank you very much for that. That was awesome. Okay, good. Now, moving right along quickly, we're straight on with the Crypto Fire Alliance. Is that right? Yeah. James, are you right? Good. Are we going to roll a video first, or are we? Are you talking first, or video first? Tom, have you got that video there? Awesome.
feeling emotional. Some heartstrings being pulled out, I hope. Um, so we all obviously, we're all in Sydney, so we all know what the fires were like over Christmas and in the months before and around that period. And uh, effectively, you know, there was a number of fundraisers going on and we saw people even in the crypto space trying to do the same thing. And the, uh, the long story short is that we felt like we were in a really good position at HiveX to actually manage and run uh, a fundraiser and hopefully try and grow it beyond what we could do on our own. Now, um, we created, uh, initially it was just, everything was held on finder.com.au, sister company. Oh, I was just starting to wonder how I was going to move this. And what we've done is basically uh, onboard the Red Cross uh, Australia, RFSA, which is the association uh, for the RFS members, and WIRES. And now we realised fairly quickly that we wanted to make it about the crypto space, not just ourselves and, and what we could do. And uh, I'm really happy to say that we managed to pull together a huge amount of different companies and people that were more than excited to get involved. And that video that you just saw was by uh, Rob Rosenberg and uh, Hank Mango Studio. And they literally were like, hey, cool fundraiser, we're going to make this video and, and help you raise money. And it's pretty much the same story for everyone else on this list. And there's actually a couple that that aren't here, but we've got, you know, Karen from Blockchain Australia jumped straight on it. DJ um, has helped in, in so many different ways in connecting us with different groups. Mind Digital and shout out to Grant, and I think we should give him applause at the back for, uh, they donated $5,000. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's really like this funny long list. The, the logo was created by Bowalter Media out of the UK. We had a Norwegian company, uh, Cryptographen, that's like a, uh, a publisher. They had like a fundraiser um, that they, they had basically Bitcoin that they were meant to give to people that for some technical reason they couldn't. So they donated that. And um, I think, you know, we've got everyone here that's put into the cup so far tonight. It's fantastic. Obviously, you can go to the website as well, learn a little bit more about it. We've raised so far $14,605. Uh, and I'll leave you with uh, two other things. The first is that uh, in about a week's time, we've got, uh, maybe two weeks, we'll be announcing a, um, well, there's a company, F1 Delta Time, that builds digital racing car, uh, F1 cars for their game, and they're in partnership with the actual, like, F1 Enterprise. And they'll be auctioning off the Australian car in ETH, and then donating the proceeds from that into the Crypto Fire fundraiser uh, body, which I think is just really cool. And some of those cars have gone for quite a lot. and. Um, I think it's like a nice way to tie blockchain into um, like how it can actually be useful as well. So what that is, it's like an ERC721 collectible car. You log into this computer game, and you verify that you're the only person in the world that can drive this car. So if you look next to you, there's like someone zipping around and you're like, oh, that's the person that raised money and donated to the fires. Cool. Um, now the other part is that we have CryptoTag who have been very kind to donate a crypto tag Zeus that we will auction at the end of tonight. I think it retails for about 160 AU. Um, just because if the auction gets to that price, you could go online and buy it. You've got to remember that this is also going towards the uh, people impacted by the fires. And uh, it's a really cool device. And effectively, you punch in your uh, BIP39 seed. Uh, don't worry what that is if it doesn't make sense. But you, you lock in your private seed into this piece of steel, and then it backs up everything, you can bury it underground or store it in a vault, if the house burns down, your crypto will live on. Um, so if you're interested in picking that up, if your crypto is starting to go up with the market, time to make sure that your seed's safe, you can bid on this later. Um, that's what it looks like, comes with a little stampy pen thing. And the other thing we have uh, is Trader Cobb, who will be on the panel later tonight, has been extremely kind and generous in donating one of his gold tier trading packages. Um, he's probably the best one to pitch that to you, but it's, uh, you know, he's got all sorts of different courses, an online community that you can get involved with and trade with and, and become a part of. So he'll be auctioning that at the end as well. I believe that that is, there's, no, there's not even like a thank you slide. So thank you. <laughs>
Good. Yes, check one, two. Okay, so let's kick off tonight. Instead of me doing the introductions, could we all introduce ourselves? So, no time limit here, but just give us an idea of your background um, and ha what you've been doing in your career before um, the Satoshi White Paper was developed and then what you've done since then and how you got involved in crypto and what you're doing now and then we'll roll on to some Q&A. So let's start at the far end and work our way across. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay. Hello, everybody. Caroline Bowler, new CEO of BTC Markets. Before I go any further, um, if anyone in this room doesn't have a BTC Markets account already, we are running a special promotion tonight in celebration of the new CEO. Um, if you sign up and send an email to our onboarding team with the code BTCM2020, you will find a little gift of 20 XRP in your brand new account as of tomorrow. So just a little special promo to get us all kicked off the new regime. So originally uh, from Ireland, spent 10 years in Singapore, background is in banking, financial services, got involved in kind of blockchain and crypto fintech uh, 2014 in Singapore, worked with the Singapore Fintech Association as it was starting out, same same with Access, the local kind of the blockchain Australia version in Singapore. So have been there kind of from the ground up as those communities developed and grew, moved to Melbourne specifically last Saturday of September 2018, because I got surprise tickets to the grand final, so I'll always remember that date. Um, and started and was obviously involved with um, with blockchain and crypto adjacencies here over that time frame. Obviously, no BTC markets over the course of that career knew what they stood for, knew what their values were about, knew that they were aligned with my own. So when the opportunity came to become and join the team there, I jumped at it with with two feet. So I'm a new CEO. I'm only in the door about a couple of weeks. So I'm still getting to know the kind of crypto trading community here in, single, in Sydney and also in Melbourne. Um, but we've got some very big plans for 2020. So do um, stay connected to us as as, uh, as we roll them out. But over to you. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, it's, so my name's Grant Colthup. I'm the CEO of Mind Digital, uh, one of Australia's newest crypto exchanges. Uh, so basically we're, you know, really full hitting our full steam as of the end of the month. So you can sign up now, fully, fully available. Pre uh, Satoshi, I was a proprietary trader. Um, and then since then spent most of my time running money professionally and managing uh, very large multi asset portfolios. Uh, took the opportunity to jump. So I'd been in crypto since about 2016, 2015. Took the opportunity in 2018 to jump over um, and take up to develop the business that we are trying to do with My Digital. It's awesome. Um, hey guys, my name is Fred Chibesta. I'm one of the co-founders of Finder.com.au. Um, maybe you might be able to sing that jingle, which is kind of cool. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, I could tell the story about that. Um, so. Um, I could tell you the full history of what I've been doing, but I've been focusing on Finder for 10 years now. I've been rolling out around the world, so I was just in London. Um, we launched um, Crypto Finder, so in 2017, then we launched Hivex, which is a OTC brokerage, um, in 2018. And um, been doing Crypto Finder, the YouTube channel, just interviewed Roger Ver the other day, which is kind of interesting. Um, I actually had dinner with Craig Wright two weeks ago. That was interesting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a very controversial thing to say, but um, I know you've been hanging out with Craig as well. <laughs> um, so we can talk about big blocks. I'd love to talk about that. Um, and um, you know, I, I, I think we write about cryptocurrency on Finder uh, in a massive way. So um, you can see that obviously on all the different sites. We publish that all around the world. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. I'd like to follow. Uh, my name is Craig Cobb. I'm one of the founders of TraderCobb.com. Uh, prior to getting into crypto in 2017, all I did was trade, focus, educate, and um, really just make a crust out of the markets. Um, you know, I get asked all the time, why on earth would you teach other people? Um, because uh, to be dead set honest with you, I was trading foreign exchange, bonds, stocks, commodities, all these different things, and it was boring. When you become a good trader, it should be boring. No emotion involved. Yes, I was making money. Yes, I was spending time with my children. Yes, I was going for surf, spear fishing, and fishing. Uh, but there was like, it was like, you know, you get, this, you get that itch you can't quite reach. 
I finally found where that itch lived, and that itch lived <laughs> in being an entrepreneur. Uh, so I started Trade of Cobb to help others to learn how to trade. Uh, I travel around the world and speak with people such as uh, and uh, Roger Ver and others. Uh, the Trader Cobb Crypto Podcast is where you might have heard about me, perhaps. And um, I love what I do, genuinely. And I hope you do too. Hey guys, I'm Omar. What was I doing before the white paper? Oh, I was studying finance. You weren't born, were you? Nearly. Oh, so Man, 2008. It, it, it was playing <laughs> COD. <laughs> yeah, that's actually how I did find Bitcoin. I was playing yeah. not COD, World of Warcraft. <laughs> I was playing World that's of Warcraft. And somebody jokes. told me about this. <laughs> it was actually someone told me you could buy drugs online. I was like, really? How do you do that? And yeah, Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin was about. I remember my first Bitcoin transaction. We bought 100 Bitcoins for like 30 bucks. <laughs> that was very expensive weed. But yeah, that's, that was my stumble into Bitcoin. And since then, I've been very focused on Bitcoin. I mean, I do have an education in finance and I don't trust your financial systems. I'm here to diverse these people because they're all crypto people. I'm the Bitcoiner. That's cool, 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 cool. <laughs> okay, so I remembered what we're here tonight for. And tonight was all about 2020 and what's ahead. So well, let's... Um, Let's start off with talking about um, you know, where we're at in the market and what's ahead. Omar, while we're with you, um, straight up, you're the Bitcoiner. Is the, um, is the halvening priced into the Bitcoin price? And does anyone, know what the, does anyone not know what the halvening is, means? First of all, DJ, can I ask, is it the halving or the halvening? Oh. I really need, this has been a massive discussion on Twitter. Guys, who thinks it's the halvening? Tomato, tomato, shut up. Oh. Really? <laughs> I thought it was. Most of you think it's the halving? The halving. Halvening. 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 Really? Shine or the shining? Come on. The shining. Yeah, well, yeah. that's right. It's the halvening then. That done. Move on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I priced in or what? Uh, okay, so I've been reading a lot about... So the whole theory about the price being... The school of thought around the price... The halvening being priced in is that most of the Bitcoin is being held by whales and said whales already know that the happening is happening. As such, these whales have already set the price at a certain level. I mean, price is just demand and supply. Now, the reality of it is I really do not think it's priced in for one simple reason. I mean, you have supply, demand. Demand doesn't change. The supply changes as soon as the happening happened. Prices start going up even slightly. More and more newbies like last time, 2017, start piling on. More people pile on, snowball effect, we have another bull one. So I don't really think it's priced in, no. There's still moon to come. Good. Uh, anyone else Buy got more. any comments on that? Oh, I tend to agree with Omar. I don't think, you know, it's um, the best way I had it described, um, you know, coming from an equities background is, you know, every quarter Apple is going to release their earnings and traders know that and, and you know, leading up to the, you know, 20 minutes before the announcement, Apple share price will go all over the place and we'll start doing that. And then the announcement will happen and it'll still then take a different path. Now, obviously we know that the, the, the pure fundamentals of Bitcoin are not going to deviate around that announcement, but it's still the anticipation. It's how people, people aren't rational as we think. They're, they're going to act differently now. We can say, you know, with some time away from it, they're going to, oh, I'm going to plan for it. I know this is going to happen. That's the way I'm going to act. And then you get closer to it. And as Omar says, if the price starts drifting higher, then that, their perception of the fact that it went higher going into it then starts changing their perception of what the event actually is, which then affects the event itself. Mm. I'd like to add to that in, in the sense of maybe a left field comment here. Who, who was involved in being aware of Tesla's recent stock madness? Put your hands up nice and high, yeah? So, so what did, if I was to say to any of you here, what does that remind you of? What would you say? Bitcoin. 2017 Bitcoin. Now that is what the attitude was to the retail investor around that event. Now I think the Tesla stock price going absolutely jats crackers, and, and, and for those that don't know what that means, jats crackers are the best crackers. <laughs> so that's why it's jats crackers, all right? Let's just get that. I haven't had down. a jats for right. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you, 
It's your mistake, I'm, not mine. I'm it's going, your mistake. I'm leaving here and I'm buying some downstairs. There you go. <laughs> but my, my, my point being is that with, with Tesla doing what it did, it was very crypto-esque of 2017. And many people went, oh, Jesus, look at, uh, look, 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 look at Tesla. It reminds me of Bitcoin in 2017, power to Bitcoin. These people are looking to exit their positions. Where are they going next and where is Bitcoin? Well, at the time, Bitcoin was just bees dicking through 10,000 US dollars, which is a five-figure Bitcoin. CNBC picked it up. Bloomberg, all the major news, uh, you know, all the major news um, uh, platforms yeah, were talking about that. I think that will help our area. But I think the biggest thing to understand is that there will be trends, there will be money flows. I don't want to see a 2017 again. I'm not saying I don't want to see the heights of that. I want to see a measured 2017. I want to see multiple entries because there is a way where you can trade throughout multiple entries over a five to six month period. Then if it does go burko or Jack's crackers, then you can actually change your entire life. I think that everything that's going on right now is absolutely perfect. And I'm really excited about this year. If, if I may just jump in on this, I, I don't necessarily have the expertise uh, of the rest of the panel with regards to the, the happening, the happening, whatever you want to call it. I did read, however, some very interesting research that came out of the Bank of England recently where they're talking about that relationship between the speculator and the people who use as a currency, which I think was very interesting just to giving a kind of a certain depth and economic depth and research behind what's happening. And I think to kind of summarize, um, they think it's bullshit. They think that Bitcoin as a device, not necessarily the, the protocol behind it, but that correlation between that speculating and money use relationship is what's screwing up the price the most. Uh, I'm summarizing. You can go and find this research yourself, but it's the Bank of England just recently brought this out. So, uh, I mean, I'm just the messenger. I'm sure you'll have <laughs> an opinion on it yourselves, but it's, but it's something, yeah, but I just think it's really, I think it's <laughs> worth considering <laughs> and taking under advisement what these guys are coming out with. But again, oh, not my position, no. but worth considering so um, I think central banks are always going to say that um, yeah. with due respect and they should because they're feeling very threatened so totally get that um, if, you, if you go back in time let's look at Litecoin Litecoin mooned for the halvening it flew up Litecoin then crashed afterwards I think that's what's interesting what's going to happen after the halvening mm. and you know um, I'm interested in mining and transaction fees and what plays out there. I think there's some interesting things. I think it eventually it'll be fine. I think we're we're in a in a in a pretty solid place. But let's look at fundamentals. We've got more wallets. We've got more venues coming online. You've got Cash App. You've got which has got millions and millions of Americans now that can buy Bitcoin. You've got just it's it's just if you go back to 2017, it was really hard to get into Bitcoin. Now you know if we get a little a snifter. But it's gonna something's gonna moon. Then the venues and just the amount that it's available, like you could just light that up. So I, I actually think you've got more powder in the keg this time than last time. Okay, um, Fred, while you got the mic, t t tell us about um, did he hold his cutlery correctly? Did he use? <laughs> an, did he, no, no, no. Did he use a napkin? Did he did he ask to be excused from the table like my son does every single time he leaves the table? Who's he? <laughs> uh, this bloke, no, this bloke. The one that shall What's not, not be named. Nakatomi the, 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 the oh, it's a whole sausage, so, sausage so, so, so that, the Aussie guy that didn't pay his tax and fled to the UK. It's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Julian Assange. I think. I think. <laughs> no, he's mate. He's yeah. other mate. <laughs> so, so the first thing I would just say about having dinner with Craig Wright is. You don't talk to Craig, right? Craig talks to you. Yeah. So, so he you, shouts at you. Yeah, he shouts. It's like really, he's like aggressively. Yeah, it starts talking about a whole. He will just change and, and then start talking about you know fraud and all this stuff and these people and la 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 and Roger Ver and he's a scammer and all this and he told me this and you're like I was like oh, I just wanted to know if you wanted some steak, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> like it's. It's not, you don't have, yeah. So that's the first thing. So I, I, I don't know whether um, that is, so there's some interesting conversations. I think the second thing is, um, if you look at that, that, what's Craig Wright's actual job, I think that's interesting. He actually works at Enchain. He, he, he actually wakes up in the morning and he goes and writes patents and he gets paid a salary. That's his actual job. He's a scientist. That's his, that's his job. And there is a CEO of Enchain. So... Just, I think everyone needs to remember that. And there is actually a private equity firm behind that. So, is yeah. Craig not the CEO? Craig 
Craig is not the CEO of Enchain, and actually, uh, um, and BSV and all those things are not. Um, that's not actually what he does. He actually just, I think he's actually quite a polarizing figure and brings attention and they just let him go. I think the thing I actually felt, and I actually, and this is big, but I actually felt that if you were going to put Craig on a, on a on, you know, just say this, I feel a bit of empathy for him because I think there's a spectrum of, I think he would be well and truly on some sort of autistic spectrum to some extent. And I don't know to how much he realizes like what other people are saying, I think he's just in Craig's world. So, you know, I, I think just sort of, if we can, I, I don't know, I just put him to the side and I just wanted to understand him as a person, which is quite, yeah, as I said, quite interesting. I don't know how much I actually landed and actually said anything to him or what he remembers from it at all. Because um, all I was hearing was other stuff about all, all sorts of other different dialogues. Um, but I think right now he really hates Roger Ver. Like, <laughs> whoa. It is like, he was telling me all about that. Like, there was a... I mean, who doesn't? They are not mates. <laughs> like, um... <laughs> the nicest guy in crypto. Yeah, yeah. They're all... That's, no, they are not friends at all. Um, I, I think the other thing that he, um, you know, as I said, he, I don't think he really, you know, has a massive input in, in terms of some of the... Where that coin's going and where... I actually think he's actually more back in like he just writes patents that's what he does yep. he, he's just a, a university guy that um and then he has a spec i guess I, I just as i said i think he just has a personality disorder yeah <laughs> 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 like and i think actually if we just if you just sort of mark that off as okay cool i think then he's an interesting kind of guy because you know what he thinks about cryptocurrency and where it's going and about blockchain he actually has synthesized a lot of those things in his mind and i think that's quite fascinating um, and he knows like just so much about so many different, I actually would put him as a polymath. Like, so I spoke to him about, he goes, he's reading the biography of Napoleon. He's doing a university uh, PhD on some law thing. He's also writing patents for cryptocurrency and he's doing maths and he codes. He's actually quite a, a brilliant person. He just has a personality challenge. The, the, you, when did you have dinner with him? Like two weeks ago. So I, the first time I met Craig was in London in October last year and it was a fairly infamous photo with me, yeah. Tone Vays and Craig Wright. And my goodness me, I have copped so much <laughs> shit for that because, but no one read what Tone Vays shirt said. And Tone Vays shirt said, everyone is Satoshi bar Craig Wright. <laughs> That's what the shirt said. But I was there in the photo going, ah! <laughs> Craig Wright's on the other side going, ha ha! And Tone's going, oh, with, with the 17 strands of hair that he has left. <laughs> Give up, Tone. I've told you 17 times. Just shave it off, brother. It's okay. You can still be confident without any hair. Anyway, long story short, the funny thing was about that was that I copped so much shit for that. I had dinner with Tone that night and it, I, I, I actually did what... All of you and your little crew of Bitcoin Maximus want to do, which is hit him. I've punched him several times because he was being so rude during an auction. He was sitting up to my right. You know when you do the side punch at school? <laughs> and it really, really hurts because you've got the, that major knuckle. I hit him several times. I called him all sorts of names. Yeah. I grabbed him in a headlock. I did all this, right? And more importantly, I made him outbid himself on an art item that he didn't want. <laughs> <laughs> so you and your troop can go. In our defense, we didn't see any of that. Yeah. All we saw oh, was no! you and him smiling next to each other. If we would have seen that, you would have, been you would have taken uh, Roger's spot as the new Bitcoin yeah. business. Running a business. That's why Adrian's not here tonight. He's in hiding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no so, one from my house here tonight, is there? Uh, Maxis are chasing them down the street. They yeah, sent they, some. They started they supporting the SV. Account up with free. No, we're not free. On free. that, on that point, I want to ask Caroline a question. So, Caroline, talk to us. What BTC is doing with XRP? Sounds like you yeah, got been a load, some load to give away. Some well, <laughs> <laughs> um, there I don't know. does seem to be some speculation Brad, online like about what exactly the relationship is between BTC and XRP. Our numbers are real, what you're seeing is real, that's real liquidity. We started off a test project with uh, Ripple about three months ago where we are their XRP technology provider. 
in the Australian market. So we are the US, um, Aussie dollar to the Filipino peso. Just one tranche, we've been running that, as I say, since about last December. In January, we moved f uh, nearly 41 million Aussie dollar worth of XRP. Just this month, we have nearly reached $60 million, and it's halfway through the month. It's a real live, out in the market, fully deployed use case for blockchain technology functioning in the Australian financial markets. So that's what's happening with our XRP numbers. They're absolutely <laughs> real, they're completely genuine. You can see all the liquidity. Our exchange has gone through the roof ever since because naturally once you've got that kind of level of liquidity, it attracts other users into our marketplace. We are shipping it big time. <laughs> it's, it's the summary version of it for, for the audience here tonight. So we recommend you to come along and have a look and see what numbers we're doing. Um, I have a question for Grant. Yes, Frank. Um, <laughs> what's your theory about Ripple and its treasury right now? <laughs> Um, I believe <laughs> that they are potentially using their treasury to fund certain operations within Ripple to, as loss leaders and as a way to attract users to get transactions. So they are using pre-mined tokens, which are essentially gifted tokens to themselves, to complete those transactions. In, and, and so what, what kind of effect do you think this has on the supply of Ripple in the market? Uh, well, <laughs> well, I think it does two things. I think one, obviously, it, 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 it potentially at the end of the, at the extreme case on the right hand side means that that, ca that supply of Ripple then is completely um, free to the market, in which case that's a very, very large supply of Ripple or sorry, of XRP, I should yeah, say, which would obviously depress the price significantly. On the left-hand side, which is the good side of it, is it is, as Caroline says, it's, it is providing a, a, I guess, a demonstrable use case on the flip side. So yeah, and from what we're seeing, this is, we're seeing currency actually moving. We're, so I think this is with a, yeah, from our point of view, we're working with a well-known authorised remitter. You can find out there's all this information online. It's freely available. The relationship that's there, I don't want to disclose how much money they're transaction because that's their information and not ours. But I know what we see as an exchange, the money and the volume that's going through. So I, I can't possibly comment on what Wiffle are doing in terms of the mining or non-mining, that's not our position to talk about. What we're here to talk about is XRP as a product that's being used for Forex out in the market as it stands at the moment. Can I? So I know that, I know that XRP spent a lot of money on some MoneyGram partnership or acquiring MoneyGram, and then MoneyGram went ahead after all that money was spent and used Visa's fast money. Why did that happen? Are you asking me about MoneyGram? <laughs> no, I'm asking why. I'm asking why X, why XRP spent so much money on MoneyGram, and then MoneyGram still went with Visa's new solution. Well, I think that's probably for MoneyGram to answer, and I don't think they're on this panel. So, but so wouldn't that be a Ripple thing? Yeah, pesos. But so Visa's they're doing USD to Spain and USD internal. So I guess once that corridor is maybe opened up, because obviously they need the finance providers at each country to make the corridor live, maybe that will happen. Yeah, yeah. and as far as I know, Ripple are only live in five markets yeah, at the moment, five, five corridors yeah. at the moment. So That's uh, that, as far as I know. But 7% went through the USD-Mexican corridor. They did like 50-something million. Yeah they're, yeah, they're in with Bitso, I think, in, yeah. in, in the Mexican market. That's yeah. their exchange. So I just wanted to, um, so if I can comment on uh, some of that. I actually think this is, um, potentially could be a challenger to SWIFT, what BTC Markets is actually doing. Because um, there are corridors and there are payments and Ripple is funding the costs. So the, there's, there's some parts to this that are the, that there, you know, like you buy XRP on one exchange and you send it to across to another ledger, right? To another exchange and then you sell on both sides. Obviously there's some, there's some cost, right? But they're funding that and they're actually making a real attempt to challenge SWIFT. And so, I find that I find that they think there's some more to dig in this area, and I'm not sure if we have any big Ripple crew here, but um, I actually think this is a genuine thing, and I think actually BTC Markets is leading in what they're doing right now. So, I think it's a it's a, it's something to have a further dig into. And I think just with that as well, yes, BTC are leading, but 
this is also Australia and Australian technology. The tech that we have, it's all Australian IP, Australian developers squirreled away in a darkened room in Melbourne who have come up with this technology. We received extremely good feedback around our tech. We were told it was the smoothest integration that they've had with all the other providers that they've had in the market. I think this is a really good Australian success story. It's great. Uh, yeah, it is. It's, it's fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. And, and we're really happy and proud to kind of fly the flag mm. as an Irish woman for Australia. Uh, for with this, I think, it's, I think it's fantastic. I think it's something for the community to you be You was he or you? I will be soon. No, you're, give me about oh, eight you're years. So PR or She's just been practicing real <laughs> hard and acting Is there enough from, yeah, yeah, there from immigration here tonight? <laughs> No, I'm there's legit, some, I'm I know legit, there's some journalists legit, up the back. I'm legit. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, there's just, an, just, just there's an undercover XRP. police officer who's just walked in. <laughs> You're not immigration now anymore, are you, Sam? Hand over everything on <laughs> <laughs> Just on XRP as, as a back. token. Is oh, that a question? Oh. Hang on, no, no. You, if you're asking questions, you need to speak into the microphone because this is being recorded live. Introduce yourself. Yeah, g'day, I'm Toby. Um, so how does that tech work? How do you turn Aussie dollars to pesos? What's the step through process? So at a very high level. Uh, so m I go into a remitter such as MoneyGram. I hand over my Australian dollar and they go, thank you very much. We give the agreed exchange rate. They then convert that Australian dollar into XRP. That XRP goes across our exchange into the Philippines where it's matched on the other side. And that XRP is then changed into Filipino peso. That process happens in a matter of seconds. So, so, so you're acting as a middleman between remitters? Well, we're the exchange that just transmits the token. Of that exact value? Of so, the so if I do a 100 grand Aussie into whatever Filipino yeah, pesos, you do that equivalent in Ripple? We don't set the FX on it. Yeah. We just literally receive the token. We receive the instruction from the remitter yeah. to move the XRP as agreed within that contract. And then on the other side of the exchange, they then convert that XRP into a Filipino peso. Uh, so, so to end, I think the gap you're, the, you're um, asking is what happens if the two prices are different on the two exchanges? And that's where Ripple's stepping in. I uh, got it. Yeah, and the, well, it's uh, also uh, times from that point of view, is it's even in seconds, but it actually can be instant because it's just a, it's just a ledger entry. Yeah, but it, is it not adding a step rather than going Aussie to peso? Aren't you going Aussie to Ripple to peso? Yeah, but there's what there's a 1.8 billion dollar personal remittances market between Australia and the Philippines, and these are small personal remittances that are going in. So rather than them going into the bank or any other, you know, FX provider, if you like, they can go in via MoneyGram. It's secure. It's safe. They can pre-agree the contract price, and it can happen so swiftly. And I think to use swift, it can happen so quickly. <laughs> and that's where <laughs> an exchange like BTC steps in and helps facilitate, from a technology point of view, the speed of that transaction and the safety of that transaction. Is that lowering the cost for the MoneyGram clients? Yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, because you're stepping, you're removing all the banking layer, you're removing all the human touch to a certain extent out of what would be usually, yeah, as you know yourself, if you've ever tried to send money from a bank account to another, like yeah, you yeah. know how long that process can take, whereas this is through, through the exchange, it's much quicker. All right, thanks. Awesome, okay, a few questions. Start over this way and I'll get over there. Um, just a quick question for everyone on the panel. Um, let's assume that the adoption of uh, Ripple as an exchange mechanism increases worldwide. Uh, what kind of effect do you think that's going to have on the price in relation to the current price? Well, if I can just, I won't go too deeply into that, but this is probably where the differences lie of the use of XRP as a different type of token. It's not necessarily a currency token or a currency, a cryptocurrency, it possibly has that utility value attached to it. So I think perhaps the pricing around it will be different from say a Bitcoin. But again, it's to the rest of the panel to kind of comment, as I'm sure there are lots of opinions on it. But from my point of view, that would be one consideration. But over to the rest of the panel. <laughs> Look, there's opinions and there's facts. There's opinions and there's facts. Uh, I'm quite impressed by what you've said, and, and XRP was my best uh, trading token in 2018 because you went up and you went down. Uh, your volatility was insane, and I, I love trading XRP, but I'm a trader. I, I, I'm not one of these people that dig into and, and, and take sides. I couldn't, I couldn't care. Like, I've been a trader for 14 years. I, if I'm trading Rio Tinto, I'm not looking at it going, oh, Gina, or I'm, I, don't get, I don't get aggressive or emotional. I just trade what I see, not what I think. And I, I, I'm very um, c 
confused. I mean, look, in an equity play, I'd invest in Ripple. In a token play, I'd trade XRP. That's my stance on it because as a as an equity player on mm. on, on the business itself, I see mm. it as being a wonderful opportunity. Uh, but that's not available outside of probably I don't know fifty million dollars investment or whatever whatever the numbers would be around that project. But you've got to look at things for what they are, not what you think they are, not what some Twitter douchebag has got to say about it. You've got to be realistic about what is. You know, understanding is different to listening. And I think that's the chasm that's being really, that needs to be breached a lot for this next generation of our movement within this space because you can't just expect to jump on Twitter and find some bloke or woman who's got the biggest following and jump on what they have to say. That is not a smart decision. Your biggest investment is your education. Now, sure, you can use the tools that are available out there, pay money or not. It's up to you to work out what you're going to do and get smarter. This is the second term. We've left 1996.com. We're approaching 2000. Let's use the tools we've got because we've got this thing called the internet. What did I say? Okay. Okay. 2000. <laughs> Was yeah. it? I've still got long hair. I've got a question here. I've got a question here. And then Karen. Catch. Because you're next. So, question here with the red box. Okay, so my question is, when that XRP gets sent over to the Philippines or wherever, um, in order to get converted back into the peso, it needs to be sold on to somebody else, right? So, to probably, I can probably circumvent where you're going with that. It's money gram on either side of that. So, from their yeah. point of view, right, it just goes straight. But they, they receive XRP, so how do yeah. they then convert that into fiat? So then it goes on to, to one of another, another exchange. exchange. Yeah. So my only problem with that is if XRP is, and I know you're the messenger, but if XRP is a useless token, then MoneyGram is selling a useless token to convert into fiat, which isn't isn't fair to a retail investor. They might not be selling it to a retail investor. They might be selling it back to Ripple. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Also, by the way, I <laughs> no, there's definitely say. no controversy let's going on here. Deny all controversy. There's no. <laughs> no, there's a, just, just <laughs> for full this supply is not going to move at yeah. all. <laughs> <laughs> supply of Ripple is potentially going to move. I'm not sure, but exactly. XRP. XRP, for XRP sorry. Yeah. Just for full disclosure, I'm not actually a trader, but I agree with <laughs> Cobb. The best way to accumulate Bitcoin is trade Ripple. It's the easiest one well, to actually watch sure. and see go up and I down. I didn't say that. No, I did. <laughs> you I didn't say, say that. that. <laughs> but it's very... <laughs> okay, question down the front. No, I'm long <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> question down the front. I longed it at 28. <laughs> From Karen. Uh, so this is for Grant and for Caroline. So we've seen some poor behaviour in the exchange market over the last few months. Mm. Um, you guys, you know, Grant, you're starting a new, a new exchange. Caroline, you're starting a new role in an exchange. What, what are we going to see from exchanges over the next 12 months? What are we, what are we hoping for? Yeah. Good um, yeah, so I think, well, Nick's here, um, but I don't know if we can say this or not, but obviously I think we're going to, Blockchain Australia is going to roll out a new set of standards and requirements for exchanges who maintain Blockchain Australia status. So um, BTC Markets and IR hold that as a certified exchange. We're going through that process at the moment, which I think is a very, very good thing for the Australian industry. Um, I think the standards that are being developed are, well, are in place already and then will be mandatory for anyone else to hold that recognition are pretty reasonable. Like they're, they're, they're basically much, not quite as, as high as the US, but you know, internationally they're definitely well-recognised standards, they require decent behaviour and standards from exchanges. Um, I think, unfortunately, last year, into this year, we saw two exchanges um, out of Melbourne behave particularly poorly in the Australian space, um, and obviously that's that's been very negative and, and it's really, you know, quite honestly, it's really impacted people. I mean, I think we've spoken about this. I mean, you know, it's not, it's not even... When you put money in exchange, it's not an ICO. It's not when people put, you know, you might have thrown your five ETH into an ICO and it went to zero. Most people realise that was gambling. And, well, if you gamble, you gamble.
when you put your money on exchange, it's not a gamble. It's you're putting your money there because you trust that that money is going to be there or those coins are going to be there. So the fact that people are going out there and you know and are just basically stealing people's money is obviously a very negative thing for this space. I think I think BTC markets have had a very very good track record over a long time over that, and I think obviously hopefully you know I th I think it's. I will, you know, we've said this a couple of times. Like, you know, it's, we're not sitting here because it's necessarily the most fun thing. We want to be part of this community, but publicly to put our faces out there, to stand by our product, what we do, and let people know all that, that's because we believe in what we are doing. And I think that's an important Amen. thing. You know, I don't think none of us, we're not here to do this for another year and fuck off. Not yeah. your keys, not your coins. Actually, yeah. And if I can just kind of, on that, I suppose I've got, I've got three points to make around it. First of all, the standards, the codes that Blockchain of Australia put forward, that gold standard, obviously, in the extent that BTC Markets has, and we're delighted when we spoke with Nick last week talking about this, about rolling out across all the exchanges. Our primary function as an exchange, sorry guys, standing yeah. here. Our primary function as an exchange is to protect the consumer, protect the investor. So we fundamentally agree with the strongest, most strident protections that we possibly can put in place. And we really, really welcome this you know, development from Blockchain Australia that they're rolling it out, that all exchanges register with them, have got six months to get up to code, I believe it's six months, six months to get up to code or sling your hook. We personally agree with that. Second of all, there was a new document just brought out, new paper brought out for my OSCO last week that we've been looking at, which is setting the standards at an international point. It's putting out to all the regulators. Toby, 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 guys, guys, guys. If you need to talk, up the back, there's a private room for you. These guys need the stage, thank you. So second of all, IOSCO, the international body that speaks to all of the exchanges worldwide and all the regulators worldwide, put out a toolkit advisory across loads of different sections, particularly around consumer protections. They want uh, investor protection, they want fair and efficient market, uh, market operations, and they want to increase the investor market. Those are facets that us as BTC markets are really interested in. We've started looking at that toolkit. We're trying to cross-reference it against our own processes that we have internally, because we, like you, exactly agree that this market needs to up its game, and we're really, really happy to be part of a, 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 a good body and with a other um, peer group that equally wants to raise its game. It's really, really important for the safe development of, every, of all of us and, uh, and all of our um, different exchanges. You got the point there? Yeah, I do. Um, who are you up in the game for? Um, because I'm a, I'm a trader and I like margin and there's no good Australian platforms with margin. And it's really frustrating to promote something outside of this amazingly intelligent and forth, you know, forward thinking country in blockchain. But there is still no exchange out there that I'm willing to send my clients to, to trade margin. Now, margin is a very scary thing, just like the edge of a cliff. If you don't understand that the edge of a cliff, if you walk off the edge, you will die, <laughs> that it's very freaking dangerous. If you understand that that's the edge of the cliff, I'm not going to go over there. It's okay. Education is a bridge between the both of those things, and I've, I've noticed that most Australian platforms, if not all Australian platforms, are very, very scared of margin. It's not a dangerous thing if you're educated on how to use it. Every other market in the world operates with it to a multiple of four, 50, or multiple hundreds if you're looking at foreign exchange, and if you want to go outside the domicile and regulate it. Is this Binance. within digital assets? Is it I'm trading just on the margin? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, again, I mean, I, I, you know have to look into a bit further into it, but from uh, one I'm, not, I'm not being an asshole. I'm, no, I'm just, no, I'm just no. asking the oh, question. Yeah, I want yeah, to no. send my clients Gosh, to Australian uh, business, so happy not to Hong answer. Kong or, you know. So I have to answer. From what I understand for trading in digital assets, when you start going to the margin, you start looking at some more regulatory oversight, but I could be wrong here on that. So I kind of look to my peers on that one, but as far as I know, I need an AFSL license to do that, So, I'm, yeah, you know, yeah. which is fantastic. Well, also, but to get an AFSL license, the, hoop, the steps that we have to go through as an exchange, not just ourselves, but anybody else, 
that's a very difficult process. And I, while I'm we can very be, aware of it. We're doing it at the same can, time. Right, right. So as willing and all as we are to be participants in the market to develop this product suite, and we're very, very happy and very interested and keen to do so, for us, our hands are tied because we want to operate fair and, and efficient markets. You, you we need a license. My, my biggest concern, I suppose, is this, that we've got we've got all these platforms out there that offer us 100x, and most of them go, oh, get wrecked. 125. Well, whatever the bloody, uh, give me a 1,000, I'll take it. Like, I understand how to manage risk. Uh, it, it, it doesn't come down to the amount margin. You, you've got to understand that when you offer margin, your counterparty risk on that exchange is significantly lower. If I want to trade spot on Binance, yeah, I need to have, say, 50 grand of Bitcoin sitting there to take a two grand position based on the size of that trade with zero margin, with my entry and my stop loss where it needs to be. Now, if I was to have that same position on a platform that allows me 100 to 1 margin, I need one or two Bitcoin. So my counterparty risk is significantly reduced by my understanding how to use the platform and how margin actually works. The blanket theory is margin is dangerous, margin is scary. It is incorrect, it is uneducated to have that theory and that's what I'm really trying to help to bring to the space yeah, is the understanding so, of it. Though, let's be honest, F FTX is, FTX is um, regulated out of St. Vincent's which has no regulation. So if FTX can roll up whatever thing they want and technically if you put slippage had none no but if you put if you put it if you put your ma if you put your coins at ftx i'm not saying this is going to happen because the actual ultimate parent company of ftx is a u.s regulated company True. but technically if they just shut up shop tomorrow have a good chance of getting your tokens back from i i, I, I agree with you completely they on are going to be they're going to sail off they're going to be deader than the ceo of quadriga and, uh, but where can i trade margin but better but that's point, my point where, but where no, well, i think the option? point i think the point for us is that, hang on a second as an exchange give it to me but as an australian exchange we have to operate within the regulatory framework listen 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 like how fun as it is to hear the panel argue amongst themselves um Changing topic slightly, um, I'm interested in oh, your views on Ethereum. Oh, down, mate. Yeah, down, yeah. Down, kick him off, DJ. Three strike rule, isn't it? Okay, interested in your sorry, views, sorry. guys, on ETH. Um, in the last 90 days, ETH token price has appreciated 56, roughly, percent. Do you see that as being indicative of improvement in the technology? Do you see that as simply speculation. I'm interested in your views both on price but also on where the tech's at right now and where it's going to be this year, specifically for ETH. Well, I think um, I think everyone's getting quite bullish on ETH 2.0. Mm. So um, I think that's, that's, that is being combined with Bitcoin obviously just rising and it pulling up ETH as well. But, you know, I think they brought forward some of those plans as well. And that's, a, again, a, quite a bullish sign. Um, they've been working really hard at that for a long time. Um, and so everyone's kind of freaking out and going, hey, if I need to stake ETH, I need to get certain amounts. So everyone's buying and holding and then it's removing supply again. And so it's causing a lot of um, um, movement there. I think the other thing is that there are some very interesting um, things that are, s that, are, that are actually removing a lot of ETH from the market. So MakerDAO is pulling ETH out of the market. Um, Synthetics is actually pulling ETH out of the market because it's, it's got DAI um, with it as well. I think they call it Psy or something like that. Going to ETH Collateral as well. And Yeah, ETH Collateral, so it's interesting. I, I just think there's a lot of things sucking ETH out of um, the market right now. As and opposed to ICOs for your C20s, which mm. probably right. won't happen again, we right. assume. 100%. So th obviously they were... They were <laughs> I don't know if that's <laughs> going to happen again. Um, I think that's done. I think anyone who tries to do an ICO right now gets an ACCC letter or something. Like, it is <laughs> locked up. Like, um, I think only equity plays are really where it's at now and that's that's great i think to some extent um but i think i think so so, so those three factors um i, I think I, I think DeFi particularly some of the, you know guys like nexo compound finance they're actually getting some serious funds underneath their belt and making a lot of loans and again that's just locking down crypto into places and being staked for cash back so i, I think some of those things might be might be helping the supply to, to reduce Cool. I think you also, so from a very technical, well, not technical, but from a, a literal don market donax point of view, so um, I'm not sure if the crowd knows what PLUS token is. So one of the, la well, yes, probably the largest crypto scam in history. Um, so whilst there's still, the BTC of PLUS is still being liquidated, 
pretty sh from the good reports you hear, the ETH uh, holding of Plus Token has finished. So if you think that there was, you know, selling pressure coming from that, that's finished. Uh, it broke out the technical level, so the ETH BTC cross technically starting to look a lot more bullish. I think personally think that's the the number one indicator in crypto of risk appetite is ETH BTC. When everything's going to crap, people sell ETH by BTC. When everything looks reasonably okay, they buy ETH and sell their BTC. You know, because especially because especially if you're a if you're a crypto only person. You know, that's your probably your metric of value, right? Because, you know, you go to BTC, ETH, that cross collapses, you switch back in, you've actually made some pretty good money, assuming you're not looking at it in a fiat sense of what the BTC USD price has done. On the tech side, it just seems like the other big thing actually on ETH that's, a, I think, this is the 2020 killer is these things called, um, it's got to do with zero proof knowledge theorems and zero proof knowledge ZK rollouts yep. yep so zk roll-ups and snarks and all that type of stuff long story short i have no idea it's super freaking technical what it actually does what i can tell you what it does from a exchange point of view is something that really interests me it's essentially it's an off-chain scaling solution so we're going to see dexes i'm going to say within the second half of 2020 your piece of crap IDEX at the moment, which is not bad, but it does maybe about 2,000, 3,000 transactions per second. Okay. We're gonna have new DEXs are gonna do 20,000, 30,000 TPS, and it's all gonna be based on the scaling solutions out of the zero proof knowledge stuff, which is, I think, that's the most exciting thing in ETH at the moment. Greg, can I just say, uh, 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 you and I trade differently. You, you're a, bo a bonds trader, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I've traded pretty much anything and everything that moved uh, as a personal trader. But what, one thing I want to back him up on on that is that what you just said about the ETH BTC pairing is, you know, you don't, you don't learn that from textbooks because they don't exist. You learn that from being a good trader and understanding what's going on in the markets. I, I, I look at it exactly the same way. It's a risk appetite indicator for me. Um, and it's been doing phenomenally well. There's not that many liquid contracts to trade it yep. properly, uh, which is unfortunate, but you can, you can pick up other options. When I say options, I don't mean financial options i mean options around that same it's kind of like an altcoin market because eth's the big brother of the altcoins right if ETH's moving then chances are a lot of the projects that are built on eth will also get a bit of a kick in the pants and start to move so i just i just find that interesting it's one of those little snippets that you pick out whether you're in the crowd or you're you're an actual panelist where you cool. go yeah two, I got a two question. guys from two different worlds pick up the same thing thanks folks good 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 i got a question on the back here um, do you agree uh, uh, with uh, Tim Chopper about his 250k prediction next bull run? And if not, where do you see the prices in next bull run? And what about Ethereum as well? Thank you. So yeah, so I, I interviewed Tim. Um, yeah, that was I think last year, end of last year, and he got a chance actually to predict Bitcoin price right at the end in, on the show. But um, so he's 2023. 250 i think that's his that's his mark and he's like insanely bullish on that he's still buying bitcoin as well i'm like you know he got the seventy thousand bitcoin and he's still loading up like he is yeah like that's that's a bitcoin bull i, I think and he's coming to our conference next month in melbourne as well mm. he's a he's april, a really smart sorry, guy oh, sorry april 28th what, what's the date mate? 28th, 28th or 30th of april in melbourne in physical form if, yeah, physical form. He'll be there, mate, for you. For you. Rub Very shoulders. Truly. <laughs> I'm, I'm organising all the VIP parties, so just let me he know. He comes in a Zorb, so he doesn't have to touch peasants. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, live live on stage. And we'll do some do some discounted tickets, but, you know, you've got to look after us, right? <laughs> and, and, and You're not supposed to wink, wink out loud, or? DJ. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hang on, tickets. now, where was the question here? Sorry, yeah. Fred, were you, were you still... This well, is getting very loose, this panel yeah. tonight. Yeah, he was I still think, talking. Um, <laughs> no, I just think that it's interesting to think, like, so someone who's had such forethought, you know, and buying, that's a, it was a lot. I think it was 70,000 yeah. at In the FBI bucks, auction. At the FBI auction. Yeah. 70,000 Bitcoin for a thousand bucks a pop. And, you know, that's a, like, that's a, and a long time ago to make that call. That's a mm. big call. And he purposely bought them clean. Yeah. And he got them re, they got them yeah. re, basically, I don't know if you call them re-stamped. So the Wankel boss probably want to buy them. Yeah, mm. no, that's true as well. Um, so, so, but I think what I'm trying to say is that if you think about that, um, someone who's had that forethought and he's still calling again 2023. That's his. That's his. That's the prediction on that. 
So that's yet another three years. Mm. I think if you look at like what the halvening, the previous halvening, um, and you look at the bull run, and I think maybe he's he's got some theories around that to some extent. Um, but he is ultra bullish on Bitcoin. I think he's a Bitcoin tie as well. So you can tell him to bring mm. that. Awesome. Okay, questions? I've got a quick one. Grant, we were talking yes, a little earlier. Interest on crypto, a uh, yep. couple of other points. Did you want to give us a little bit of a snippet? Yeah, sure. So um, I think obviously there's a lot of people have started to see um, exchanges offshore. Um, so we're going to start rolling out. So you're going to be able to deposit your crypto to mine digital and we'll be paying you interest on that. So if you deposit one BTC, there'll be options to do lockups. So three months, six months, 12 months. You can do rolling. If you do rolling, you basically say, I want my BTC back. It'll be back to you within 24 hours. And you get paid the interest in the crypto. So it's not in a fiat money. So you actually, if it's, you know, if you put in your one BTC, it's 10% for a year, just using round numbers here for a point, you'll get 1.1 Bitcoin back at the end. And is that to finance my margin trading? <laughs> <laughs> Craig, that potentially- Please, could mate, I want to yeah, support you. I would oh, really would love to. Partial, yes. Coming soon, coming soon. Coming soon, yeah. Okay. So I want to ask a question on this. Um, has anyone noticed, I think, um, so BlockFi is still, what, 4%? Mm. Um, whereas Compound.Finance is, the prices of interest rates have crashed. I don't know if anyone's yep. seen that. It's pretty rough yeah. in terms of that whole model. I don't know whether that's... So it's got to do with, so basically what it actually comes back to do with is what's... Um, it's got to do with the funding cost on the major futures exchanges and got to do with what's called the shape of the futures curve um, and the way that you imply back out funding costs of that. So there's a lot of really, really smart speculators out there who are necessarily, you know, they'll buy Bitcoin, sell the big, lend it somewhere, um, get a rate back in and then hedge themselves out. So they have zero Bitcoin in, um, price risk, but then they're capturing a funding rate. Um, and at the moment, that is really, really pushing down the rate. So you've seen Nexo. Nexo have done it on both legs. So Nexo, as you said, Fred, rightly so, mate. They push down the rate they will pay you for your BTC. So the, the market rate on Nexo was sitting, which is a good retail, you know, publicly available rate to go by, um, was sitting about 6%. I think, that, as you said, that BlockFi dropped even below that 4%, which has been a big mark. So the, the insta rates sat about 4% for a long time. But then also what they've done is they've actually hiked up their crypto loan rates as well. So they were sitting at about that 8% where you know, you'd pledge up 50% of collateral and you'd, no, sorry, uh, LVR 50% and you'd, you'd get about 8%. I think they're nearly, at the moment, starting to touch on double digits. And it's got to do with that funding structure of what's going on in Bitcoin at the moment. Basically, it's because the market's been rallying. Everyone wants to get long. And people then go, well, I don't want to, if I can't buy a coin, can I synthetically get long? And then the, the more people want to do that in the synthetic market, the higher it pushes up the funding cost. So Grant, are you talking about a four to 8% yield on crypto locked away for a term? Yeah. So, I mean, we're always talking about mass adoption, right? How to get more people in. Mate, look at interest rates right now. They're the lowest they've ever been. And I, I personally can't see them climbing anytime soon, right? You, you, Agreed. You, you look at the yields available in particularly Sydney, Melbourne, the major city property markets, the yields are batshit because the prices are high and the yields are low. You know, the, the, chasing a yield play for a wealthy investor or an SMSF has never been harder and you've never had to be more creative. Mm. So why is, why, <laughs> Maybe Nick, you know, mate, who, who's driving that force? You don't know? I mean, that just Still seems like risky. a massive gap in the market. Well, right? I, I think it's, I, I personally think it's for anyone who, you know, you're, you're right, you say, especially like you look at the SMFS space, right? If you're sitting there, you know, if you're, especially if you're under the age of, say, 50, yeah. the fact that you might have whatever, doesn't matter what your balance is, that you go out and go, I'm going to buy, you know, Obviously, I'm going to be biased and say, well, I'm going to buy probably 50% of my SMFS in crypto. It's, by the way, it is 100%, but that's well, a buy a different house, fact. Right? But you the go out and you put, you put 50% in there. Yes, you're going to price... The price of BTC is going to move around that, right? But then the fact of the matter is, all you've got to say to yourself, if you can, if you can think that crypto yields are going to remain higher than cash yields, which is 
not hard to say. So that was investing in a so property. Exactly. So if you think that, and you can say to yourself that you're gonna get six to seven percent a year yeah. for a ten year period. Well, from a compounding point of view, that puts you then basically back as a double. So even if then the price would have to drop a lot by the end of that 10 years for you to be worse off, yeah. if you think from that point of view, on the flip side of it, if the, obviously the price goes up, well, every double, time the double. price, exactly, or you can do, you can keep trimming it as wow. it goes up and, yeah. and keep rebalancing such that you still get the same amount. But I, I, we, so um, Matt and I, Matt's our COO, had a meeting today with uh, one of Sydney's, like they, they literally have become the fastest growing traditional broker in Sydney. And we went in there and you speak to them and they still look at you cross-eyed over what crypto is. You explain this trade to them, you explain the opportunity that they could be telling. So these guys have just signed on uh, a, a um, wealth management um, network around Australia. 24,000 people are signed up to that. And you still go in there and you explain this to them to say, can you, can you even, we don't expect you to sell it to your clients. Can you just mention it to them? Zero. Well, Won't happen. Grant, let's stop talking there yeah. because we'll talk about that after. Yeah. Right? Question you here. Hear any of that? For Grant, um, if you have crypto locked up with uh, mine, yep. um, let's just assume, like I hope it doesn't happen, but let's assume that, 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 that the exchange is hacked. Yep. What so happens to the locked up crypto then? So, so our crypto all sits, um, so it's covered by insured custody. Uh, so essentially, yes, it would be a process, but we would get the value of that back. Um, that's covered up to $50 million. Yep. How long? Uh, I would say, you know, you look at a, probably an insurance claim of that magnitude, you're gonna be looking at a four to six month process to work that through. The other thing of what it actually is, is the way that the wallets are set, our wallets are set up, is actually 90% of all of our crypto balances are kept in frozen storage at all times. So the ability for a hack to have a disastrous economic impact upon our exchange is very low. So if we had, even if we had a billion dollars on exchange, basically 900 million is always in frozen. I, I just had an idea, just a little insight. Um, there's a science called biomimicry and basically the universe found that by making things into cells it's a lot safer. Yep. And I have, in my life, like I'm quite old, had friends overseas who were mafia people, extortionists. And, um, no, no, it's, it's like... So you get it accounts, As right? long as you don't have anything for them to take off. Yeah. No gold, they're not going exactly. to... What are they going to so, be so polite? No, but let it's let a good... Finish. Let me finish. The, if, if the wealth is distributed... Through mul oh, just, just a concept. On multiple nodes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's much more so, so, costly but this to is, hack. We're you're exactly right. The, the other thing is, is so the, the largest actions that have actually happened are South Korean and Japanese exchanges. And for God knows what reason, just the way they approach cryptography and security is just vastly different than exchanges, I believe, in Australia, Singapore, the US um, and Europe approach it and the fact of the matter is a lot of these exchange the the, the japanese and Singa uh, south korean ones technically just do leave it in hot wallets floating around i believe it's actually got to look you know you think back at it culturally they are very in the their society trust is a big thing so there's not necessarily always the fear or worry that that action is going to happen against them Whereas when you think about from our point of view, I look at it as I have a custodial responsibility back to you as my client to provide to your custodial offering. That is who I am. I'm your custodian. You give me your crypto. It's my duty to keep it safe. And that's why we have this technology in place that keeps it basically in frozen. Well, keeps it in frozen. <coughs> I, I, I just might add one thing. I could, um, one of the other things that blockchain Australia is working on at the moment, we've got a data security working group that is probably two thirds of the way You will actually be able to differentiate between someone who's got best uh, recognised best practice versus someone who doesn't, and then you can make your own judgments based upon that insight. I hope you get that live by probably April May. Okay, question, let's let's get this let's get the giveaway happening or the auction. But there's a question here. Uh, like, you know how Binance lists a new alt every week with 75 times leverage. How does that affect things? 
Is that good I, or I bad? I don't touch it. You know, you, you, when you're looking at leverage, you got to look at you got to look at liquidity. I'm not going to touch anything where there's leverage available and there's no liquidity. Uh, you've you've got to first of all work out your position sizing and work out whether and you know there's, there's so much talk about look at the your buy walls, sell walls. Psh, yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm asking fake. from like a point of could 70. that suppress price hugely on something like Tezos? <laughs> Long that shit. <laughs> From a trader's point of view, I, I, I couldn't care less. Mm. From a trader's point of view, I, I don't care. Um, you know, I, I don't care about you falling in love with a token. It's not yeah, my yeah, interest. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not talking from a trader's perspective. I'm right, you're talking, talking like from overall, a margin point. Is that point bad or is I, that good? I don't think it can because they can't longs and the shorts and it's eventually end up... Yeah, well, they don't have to, like. So, I mean, essentially, this comes back to a thing that's in the FX game called B-booking which is where you basically yeah. get your clients to put all their positions on and then you ram them out of their positions. So let's be honest, Binance, if they know that all their clients at the high, Tezos has gone up to a high and they're shit tons leveraged, well, fuck you, I'll just go on the spot market, flag yeah, Tezos down, stop week. them all out and just freaking collect all their money. Yeah, that happened at Ripple like, last yeah, week. Yeah, yeah. Like so the Ripple one last week, exactly. So oh, yeah, yeah, so, so oh, long and short of it, I think it, it, leads, it will lead to funny buggers absolutely <laughs> going on with it. Um, is that because why Australia doesn't touch that? Or? It's, that, that is definitely, I mean, ASIC definitely is, has a very dim view of that activity going on and people have gone to jail for that type of thing. The main issue is, is I, 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 there is one thing I will say, and I, this sounds sort of strange, but it is the truth. At the, matter of the, day, at the end of the day, having 75x leverage on Tezos is just a ridiculous concept. You don't need to own that much Tezos. If you think it's going up, 10x, 20x is probably pretty reasonable and you'll still make a bloody good return on it if it goes up. 75x, essentially all you're turning it into is a, is a, it's a gambling product because you think about that, if that goes up 1%, that's 75%. So unless you're putting in a reasonably big balance and have a really big you know, gap to your liquidation level, you're going to get liquidated like that. You look at, again, FX brokers who used to offer 1,000x leverage, they did it and all the clients had got pinged around. They'd just come on, put their trades on, get stopped out, stopped out, stopped out, stopped out, stopped out, stopped out. It's a way, it's a proven way for people to make money, AKA, Binance. yeah, Binance. <laughs> yeah, it's not yeah. because Most they're developing you for a product for you, the user, the trader, that is sensible and is going to help you. Trust, I've, at other times, yes, I've traded on, on in traditional markets, yes, I've traded well above my leverage constraints. And that's just by buying more contracts rather than because the, the leverage is fixed. Long term, basically, you're always going to hit a zero at some point if you trade too much leverage. And so I would say if you are trading leverage, I think you always need to actually really tailor your own strategy to how much can I lose, what do I want to lose, and then what's a reasonable amount within that. So for it might be 5x, 20x. I think beyond that, you're really just taking a, you're just taking a punt, especially in crypto where you don't know when announcements are going to come. So you could be sitting there thinking Tezos is awesome, which, you know, obviously price has bloody done really well lately. And then, you know, three seconds later it comes out, the foundation's getting sued again and the price is down. And, you know. But let's not forget the other side of that. I mean, I, I, I agree with everything you're saying there, mate. But, I mean, look, I, for one, I don't use Binance margin. I think it's terrible. It's horseshit. I use F, FTX at the moment and BitMEX. Um, now... Simply because there's, look, they're all shit. I'll, I'll be honest, they're all shit. They're all terrible. None of them give me the types of orders that I want from trading traditional markets. Again, you know that. Um, I, I am trading the best of a bad bunch. I am aware of the risk that I carry holding you know, uh, Bitcoin or capital on these platforms, but the margin helps me to feel a little more comfortable at the counterparty risk. So let's say I hold two Bitcoin and I make 20,000 US dollars in, in trades. Well, and Bitcoin's around 10,000. Well, I just pulled my mon money off and sit in my cold storage or in Bitcoin or do whatever I want. Now I'm basically trading with, and now it's my money because I'm the one who's worked for it to make those profits. But in the same respect, you just got to have a methodology around what you do. It's, it's, it's like if you're trading in a segregated account in Australia, you've got to guarantee, a government guarantee, I think it's up to 200,000. Uh, so you wouldn't, you, you, you never go above 200,000 in your account because after that, if the platform does go to bust, like a, a big CMC markets or whatever, you're, the government will eventually give you that money back. You've just got to know the environment you're working in, be aware of the risks, understand how to manage those risks as good as you can. But there's always a black swan event and you just got to be careful. 
Okay, my watch is telling me to say thank you very much to the panellists. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. But I want to get James up. How, we, how do you want to do this, mate? I'm going to yeah. hand the mic over to you. Going once, going twice. Um, yeah, so we're just going to finish off with a... Hello? You guys can chill there. <laughs> I've never done an auction before. It, it's, it's occurring to me as I stand here thinking, all right, so obviously we're going to start at $1, so we're all in yeah. the game. Now, first I think it's probably worthwhile just double checking. Does everyone understand what this is at a higher level? It's a, a titanium cold storage uh, private key like wallet, right? So what this means is that when you have a wallet like a Trezor or a Ledger, part of that process of setting it up is that you get a private key, otherwise known as a seed, and that is 12 to 24 words that backs up all of your cryptocurrency that you're managing on those wallets. Now, this is not a hardware wallet. This is a basically a steel plate <laughs> that you can etch the key that backs up your hardware wallet into and that means that if something happens that could destroy a less mm -hmm. robust version of that you can have some comfort in knowing that yours is stored in one of these it's bushfire proof that's exactly right and um, it retails at $160 the crypto tag guys have given it to us at zero cost so it's 100% going into the CryptoFire fundraiser. So yes, you could go online, but this isn't any crypto tag Zeus wallet. This is a CryptoFire fundraiser crypto yeah. Zeus wallet, right? <coughs> now, bidding starts at $1. We accept Bitcoin, ETH, Litecoin, whatever cryptocurrency you want, or cash. We'll go original if you need. Uh, maybe the best way is hands up if you're in for a dollar. Dollar. Who wouldn't be? I'm, I'm bidding on that. Yeah, I'm everyone's in. in for a dollar. Everyone's in for a dollar. You can put we'll it on eBay faster. at that rate. Go, go Jamie. Jimmy, fast. All right. Ten dollars, ten dollars, ten dollars. Fifteen dollars. We've got go, 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 20. Go, go. 50. 50. 50. DJ. DJ's 50. at 100. DJ. We've got 50 here. 50 80. There. Is that an 80 over there? 100. Pumping 100 up DJ. To 100 dollars. Can I get a one? One fit. Was that you? Was yeah. that you, Grant? 150. Yeah. Okay. 200. A DJ. DJ's on. DJ's on the bus. 201. Yeah. He's up. He's outbidding himself. Alpha, yeah, yeah. Alpha, alpha bidding. Yeah. Okay. So Toby's not only can he store his seed safely. Toby's in 250. Tobes, is that right? Toby's got a fine of shutting 250. down. 250. 250. Tobes. That's it. Done. Be taken. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're in for 250 for the hub yeah. for the cold storage wallet, DJ. It's over to you. 251. 300. 300 dollars. <laughs> Absolutely. That's it. Well, that's You're his last. You're going to yourself again. <laughs> He's out. DJ. No last offers. 301. Oh, 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 DJ with the 305. No, mate, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> Grant. It's, it's, it's all twice. yours. Twice. Yep. Three times. Oh, we're done. Well done. Thanks, Grant. <laughs> Thanks, man. Now, the second auction item that we have tonight is Trader Cobb's gold package. I'll give you the mic. I think you can pitch. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, what we've got here is an auction for a trading program that will change your life. Literally, it will not just change your life, it will also change the lives of the poor pricks that are sitting down there on the south coast that have no homes, no insurance, and they've got nothing. Because the money didn't go to the RFS, it went, oh, sorry, the money went to the RFS, it didn't go to the people that need the money. The Australian Red Cross, the money didn't go to the people that need it now. This is going to be going, right, to the people that need it now. And I need you now 
to step up and take advantage of something that will hopefully, for your sake, be a discounted price and hopefully, for those on the South Coast, be an extraordinarily large price. And I'm not going to fuck around. I'm going to start at one Bitcoin. The gold package will give you the access to my community for 12 months. That community pulled out five trades today with me on three of those. Every single trade was a profit. I kid you not. I am not here to lie to you, ladies and gentlemen. I am here to tell you the truth. That's what I do 24-7. I am always a truthful man. It is what my honor is. You'll get all the courses, all the structure, strategy, the management of your trades, how to be running a trading business. And normally it's 1800 US dollars. Now I noticed that no one flinched at one Bitcoin, but I'm not going to start at one dollar. I'm going to go from the top down. How about we start at half a Bitcoin because none of this money is going to me, I will add. And we've already donated. We've already been a big part of this. Let's move down. If we're talking, who's here to punt with Bitcoin? Raise your hand if you've got Bitcoin that you will put down. For fuck's sake, put your hand up, God damn it. <laughs> Don't be tired asses. This is our opportunity right now to show the crypto community is not a bunch of fucking scammers, but a bunch of good people that are happy to help others. Now, I've put a lot of time and effort into this, these fundraisers that have been going around and doing what I can. Now, I'm asking you to do that. Now, pull your goddamn hand out of your pocket. Let's get funky. Come on, let's start at $1,000. This is over $1,800 US dollars worth of value right here, ladies and gentlemen. Can I get $1,000 Australian dollars? Raise your hand. Now, how many of you trade? Put your hand up if you trade. Put your hand up right now if you trade. You trade, you skate. You should be on this, mate. Come on, you're probably sponsored, killing it, traveling around the world, making movies. Come on, put your hand up. Give me a thousand bucks. 75 times leverage. Listen, mate, take a hundred times leverage. The education, understand how to do it and manage your risk is right there in that course. 500. Okay, we're starting with 500 with the man at the back who's very handsome, has fantastic hair. He's about 25 years old. I can, I can really drop your age if you bid higher than him, ladies and gentlemen. For all of you who are old in this room tonight, tell me, raise your hand for 600. Who's going to go 600? We've got 600 here. 700 here. We've got 700 here. We've got 700. 700 Australian dollars. Let's go 800. Excellent to hear. Come on, let's keep going, boys. What do you got? 800, 800, 900. We're going to go 900 right here. Right, now, right 100, 900. Come on, put your hand up for God's sake. You know you can. 900, go for a thousand dollars right here come on mate don't let him fuck with you a thousand dollars one thousand one hundred dollars right here no he's out he's out he's out what about you over here master who you've just aged about 15 years i can bring it down 20 put your hand up for one thousand one hundred dollars come on mate come on do it do it for the kids here we go one thousand two hundred he's out he's out come on some big bald motherfucker stand up and take over twelve hundred right now do we have twelve hundred no going once Going twice, eleven $1 hundred dollars to the fifteen-year-old in the right-hand corner here, who's a virgin. Well done, mate. <laughs> I've never done that before, but I'll fucking do it again. <laughs> Thank you very much, by the way. I really appreciate that. It's going. It, I, I, it's a. It's a big thing. Well done. Well done. Thank you very much. He's getting better with age. Big round of applause for Trader Cobb. Thank you. Haven't seen him for a while, but he's back in fine form. Well done. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if you could pick up your glasses and put them in the recycling bin. Um, I think someone, and whoever cleaned up all those pizzas for us, but that was awesome. Thanks for cleaning up. Okay, we'll see you next time. Cheers.